Hello and welcome to another Rattle and Hum podcast. I'm Brian Houston and we're glad to have with us right now covering the Dallas Cowboys for Rattle and Hum Sports, Matthew Postens. How you doing, Matthew? Fine, Brian. How are you? Doing very well. We've got some new uh, information, things going on with the Dallas Cowboys. You wrote in your column on Sunday for Rattle and Hum Sports uh, that uh, Jerry Jones and son Stephen have differing views on Tony Romo's contract situation and how it relates to the cap. What do, what do you know? Well, I, I, you know, we all know Jerry is such a great communicator. <laughs> <laughs> what he said at the owners' meeting uh, last week was that Tony Romo's contract situation would not hamper uh, what they wanted to do in free agency. And I, I made the uh, remark that I think he should have said their lack of ability to do anything in free agency because, as anybody knows, they don't have... <laughs> draw the conclusion Romo is going to have do anything but have a negative impact on their cap space and by extension their ability to sign free agents and it kind of runs counter to what Steven said uh, last month at the combine when he said restructuring Tony Romo's contract is our best avenue to clearing cap space so we can make player moves in free agency and in the NFL draft so you know it's probably a different choice of words. We all know that Jerry doesn't always choose his words carefully. Uh, but I think the thing that I find to be the most scary if I were a Cowboys fan and not somebody just covering the team is that it sounds to me like they feel as if they have what they need, you know, barring a few alterations here and there in free agency in the NFL draft to actually make a run in 2013. And when you consider this team has been 500 each of the last two years, I, I think most people would look at that record and look at what they have and disagree. You're talking about the Tony Romo contract situation. It sounds like they're just, uh, and some of the reports I've seen today say that it's uh, within hours of actually getting done now. What would a, a contract uh, redo look like? Well, it will probably be in the neighborhood of five years. That's the type of contract that most quarterbacks are signing nowadays. You know, you're looking at a five to seven year deal. Uh, just as an example, right now, before the restructure, Romo's contract in terms of base salary is the sixth highest in the NFL going into 2013. And that ranges from Peyton Manning's $20 million in base salary to Tony Romo's $11.5 million. Uh, the guys who are making $20 million a year, these are the guys that have won Super Bowls. Peyton Manning's contract averages 20. Drew Brees' contract averages 20. Uh, before Tom Brady restructured his deal, his contract averaged $18.2 million. Joe Flacco just signed a contract that's very back-heavy so they can massage the cap, but his contract averages about $20 million a year. So the guys that win Super Bowls, they're in that $18, $19, $20 million category. Romo's going to get somewhere on that next tier, and I, I think the best, best uh, comparison is the contract that Phillip Rivers has in San Diego. Rivers signed a seven-year $98.25 million contract a few years ago, a contract that averages about $14 million a year. His base salary this year is $12 million. I think at the end of the day, Romo will end up with a deal uh, that is probably either five or six years in length and probably averages in the neighborhood of $15 million a year. And that equates to about a five-year contract that's worth $75 million or a six-year contract that's worth $90 million. Wow. I'm sure there are some Cowboys fans out there that will dispute that he's worth that much but, again, this is what the market is yielding right now. I think Rivers is a good comparison because Rivers, even though he's gone further in the playoffs, he's never been to a Super Bowl, and, he, and he, he performs at a high level statistically much like Romo does. So that's what I would be looking at for a contract extension in terms of length and in terms of value. I'd be really surprised if this contract extension is anything less than five years. Wow. And you're right. There are a lot of Cowboy fans that are not going to be real happy with that idea, but... Again, that's the price of doing business if you want to have a team this coming season in the NFL. It, it is. And, you know, right now it's a situation where the devil that you have is better than the devil that you don't. When you look at the quarterbacks that are out there in free agency, there really is nobody out there but career backups uh, and things like that. You know, take a look at the quarterback situation in the New York Jets. I think they have like six quarterbacks under contract right now. <laughs> Everybody from their starter, Mark Sanchez, to a guy like David Garrard, who's done some things in the NFL, but is really more a journeyman. They still have Tim Tebow. Uh, they still have uh, Greg McElroy. I mean, their quarterback situation is an absolute mess. They make the Cowboys look stable by comparison. 
uh, even with all the criticism of Tony Romo, I think you'd take uh, Tony Romo right now over anything the Jets would have to offer a quarterback right now. Well, you know, if you t- I think the philosophy is with the Jets, if you take all six of those guys, maybe you can make one good journeyman quarterback. <laughs> Well, if you've got a Dr. Frankenstein on your staff, maybe. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, you can't take the best parts of these guys and put them together and put them out in the field. You've got to choose one. And I, I shudder to think who the Jets are going to have out their quarterback next year. It wouldn't surprise me at all if they drafted somebody and just made the situation that much murkier. All right, and then there's also the issue of Anthony Spencer's contract. Uh, you know, they've already slapped the franchise tag on him, but it looks like they're going to try to redo that contract. What can you tell us about that? Well, that, that's an interesting contract for a couple of reasons. Number one, he makes about $10 million in base salary because of the franchise tag, so obviously restructuring his contract helps the team a great deal. The other interesting part of this is do you approach restructuring his contract as a linebacker or as a defensive end? Obviously, he's going to play a DE in the 4-3, but he's been playing for the last six years as a linebacker in a 3-4. How do you assess his value in terms of a contract? Do you look at uh, putting his numbers up against uh, 4-3 defensive ends, or do you do with putting it up against 3-4 linebackers? That's a very intriguing uh, concept to me in terms of how they'll value him. At the end of the day, I think he'll probably end up with a five-year deal, much like Romo's and that uh, it'll pro- probably be at the higher end of whatever position group they decide to slot him at. Uh, and again, it'll be one of those contracts that is low base salary to start with and is very uh, back heavy to help with the, the cap. But uh, I wouldn't rule out letting him play on a one year contract this year uh, just because there's some unknown about whether or not, to me, there's some unknown about whether or not he can make the transition from a 3-4 to a 4-3. I know he played with his hand on the ground in a 4-3 at Purdue. It was successful there, but he's been out of that kind of a system for six years. And, you know, frankly, the talent that he's going to be facing uh, as that strong side defensive end is going to be much better than anything he ever faced at Purdue six years ago. So I I think his transition from that 3-4 linebacker to that 4-3 rushing end is going to be one of the most important storylines in training camp because if he can make that transition successfully and you know show some productivity early on in the season, that's going to make that defense much better. Okay, uh, in addition to all of these things, trying to rework contracts so that they can possibly sign a free agent or two and have enough money to sign their draft picks, uh, they're starting to bring some players into Valley Ranch right now. There were two or three players that were supposed to come into Valley Ranch today to visit with the Cowboys about the possibility of joining the team. Among them, uh, safety Michael Huff, uh, another safety Will Allen, and linebacker Justin Durant. What do you know about these guys? Well, I know the most about Will Allen because Will was in Tampa Bay when Monty Kiffin was the defensive coordinator there for the Buccaneers. Uh, Will was one of the safeties that they tabbed to fill the enormous shoes of John Lynch at safety. And Will was a was a solid player. He certainly wasn't spectacular. Uh, he was usually the second or third safety in, in, in the lineup. Uh, what he does have from a value standpoint for the Cowboys is he has knowledge of the cover two. He has knowledge of what Kiffin wants out of the position. And he's been playing in that system for several years. So he can come in and he can kind of help guys like Barry Church you know, learn more about the system, be a sort of coach on the field, which is kind of what happens in these situations when you have new coaches and new systems come in. They tend to sign several of their guys because not only do they know the system and understand it and can play in it, but they can also help answer questions of their teammates while their coaches are working with other players trying to implement the system. It's actually a way that it's a something Bill Parcells did when he first came here. He brought several of his guys in as players, guys like Richie Anderson, who understood what he wanted and understood his system and was able to help get the team players that were already there with the Cowboys acclimated to what, the way he wanted to do things that much faster. Also, they're talking about bringing in uh, the former Lions linebacker, Justin Durant. Uh, they're going to need linebackers, especially people that understand how to play in the 4-3. And uh, Durant, uh, after four years in Jacksonville and another two in Detroit, he played in all 16 games last year and uh, had 103 combined tackles and a half sack. Uh, this guy could be legit if they can afford to sign him. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. All of these guys look like they're the type of 
player that we talked about last week, you know, veteran minimum guys, guys that aren't really going to cost them a signing bonus, guys that aren't going to cost them any extra upfront money. Basically, you bring them in on a veteran contract for one year, and it doesn't hurt your cap too much. Uh, the strong side linebacker position is something they have to address because everybody seems to assume that Sean Lee is going to be the middle linebacker and Bruce Carter is going to be the weak side linebacker. And that strong side position, which is really more the run stopper among the three linebackers, is that position that's kind of in flux. Ernie Sims might be in play there. A couple of guys they already have on uh, the roster, including Kyle Wilber, might be in play there. Uh, what's funny is what I find funny about this whole situation is that the Cowboys are bringing these guys in, and basically, I don't know what they're able to sell them on because they can't do anything with them. They can't offer them a contract. They can't sign them to anything. Uh, until at least they get Tony Romo's contract situation straightened out. So it's almost like, hey, we like you. We think you'll be a good fit for the system. Oh, by the way, you know, can you wait a month until we can pay you? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry says, in the meantime, you can sit here and watch it's my big screen TV. Business, that's for sure. Yeah. Jerry just brings him in and says, in the meantime, you can just sit here and watch my big screen TV. It's the it's the NFL version of window shopping. And by the way, here's <laughs> some uh, South Regional tickets for the uh, NCAA this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Have some fun. We got great seats for the Florida Gulf Coast game. Exactly. Yeah. All right, and the other guy they're bringing in is former Raiders and University of Texas safety Michael Huff. He's supposed to be have been making a visit on Monday. Um, again, uh, a, a solid veteran guy who's been in a couple of different systems. Again, he's not going to cost you a lot. Uh, he can come in and be a third or fourth safety, uh, make things more competitive for guys like Danny McRae. But uh, you know, Huff came out of college really gung-ho and, and has had a solid career, but certainly not spectacular. These guys, None of these guys you know, are going to make you uh, feel a whole lot better about the situation right now on the defensive side of the football, uh, but they're guys that can come in and at least have been in the league for several years and can at least increase competition at their position group. Also, uh, the Cowboys are talking about bringing LSU safety Eric Reed in uh, for a pre-draft visit in early April. Uh, Reed played with Morris Claiborne uh, at LSU, and uh, he was one of the best players on LSU's really great defense this past season. Uh, it would seem like if they're going to draft a safety fairly high, this guy would be a guy that they would be looking at. Yeah, most mock drafts have Eric Reed being the first or second safety off the board, and it's kind of a mid-first-round mid, mid -first round pick. That's where a lot of mock drafts have him slotted right now, and obviously with the release of Gerald Sensabaugh, this is a position of need for this football team, along with the offensive line and the defensive line. Uh, you know, Reed has great ball skills, which is important at one of the safety positions in the cover, too. He, you know, there's a, there's a guy that they consider to be the hitting safety, which was the John Lynch position, and then there's a the guy who's considered to be the cover safety. Uh, Reed certainly has solid coverage skills and can certainly tackle well. Uh, he's a nice best-of-both-worlds kind of safety. Um, depending on where the Cowboys have him slotted on their big board, if their philosophy this year is best player available and he comes up at number 18, he wouldn't be a bad pick. They've already talked to Chance Warmack. Uh, he would address their offensive line situation, certainly and they've uh, talked to a couple of defensive guys as well. You're only allowed to have a certain number of potential draft picks on campus. In other words, there are only a certain amount of guys they can invite to Valley Ranch. So uh, getting a guy like Eric Reed to come in says to a lot of people, this is a player we're interested in. This is a player that we could potentially draft if he comes to us at number 18. Uh, it shows real interest on their part, e even more than a conversation at the Combine or even more than being in a pro day because most teams have a scout at every single pro day. Having them on campus, having them sit with the coaching staff for several hours and go through the playbook, go through how they would approach different plays, there's a lot of chalk talk involved. That says a lot about their interest in the players. So they're definitely interested in a guy like Eric Reed because it addresses a position of need and because he's a guy that can probably come in right away and play for you. Don't you still think it would be a huge mistake, though, if they do anything other than address offensive and defensive line issues in the first three, and at least the first three picks of the draft? I would say so, personally. Um, you know, to me, I think you could probably find a safety through free agency. Perhaps Will Allen or Michael Huff can, can give you something for a year uh, in helping Barry Church and Danny McRae at that position right now. They've still got Matt Johnson, a guy that they hope 
uh, will be able to be healthy this year and be able to contribute. Um, you know, in the cover two, you do need to have a very good safety, but I think Barry Church can capably fill that role. When you consider how poorly this team ran the football and you consider how poorly this team rushed the passer outside of DeMarcus Ware, they really didn't get a lot of interior push last year in the 3-4. Uh, I, my personal opinion, if I were the guy in the room making the decision, uh, when I got to the first round, I would take the best offensive lineman or defensive tackle available. And then when I came back around in the second round, I would flip it around and take that opposite position unless there's somebody just so good at that similar position, either offense or defense, that I have to take them. But I, I to me, I think I could find a safety that could fill what I need for another year and then take a safety in 2014. To me... Uh, if I don't have if I don't have better players in the trenches, then I don't know if there's any chance this team's going to be any better in 2013 than they were in 2012. Totally agree. All right, David Moore in the Dallas Morning News wrote an article uh, this past weekend uh, talking to Jason Garrett, and Jason Garrett claims that uh, he really feels like his team is headed in the right direction, despite the fact that they've gone eight and eight the last two years. He's convinced that this group has developed a positive identity, uh, that they've shown some determination and some toughness that has been in question in previous seasons. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, um, you know, we talked after the uh, Larry Brown incident last year that uh, we felt as if Jason Garrett handled that whole situation about as capably as anybody could have. Um, uh, and his team showed a lot of resolve that weekend in winning that game and, and really – over the next couple of three weeks, they really showed an ability to handle things the right way when it came not just to that, but what they were doing on the field. Now, it didn't translate to the end of the season, uh, losing that last game to Washington. Uh, you know, Jason Garrett theoretically is the one that has his pulse on his team right now, the guy who understands where this team is going. And every team develops at a different rate. You know, you, you have teams like uh, the San Francisco 49ers, they didn't become Super Bowl champions overnight in the 80s. It took Bill Walsh three or four years to get the guys he needed to get the system installed to get everybody on the same page. Uh, one way of looking at it is that Jason Garrett just needs more time to get these guys on the right page. The other way of looking at it is, look, you inherited a great deal of talent when you took the job. Granted, the drafts immediately after Bill Parcells left weren't that great, but you're drafting good players now. It's a new world in the NFL where draft picks are expected to contribute much earlier on. Uh, Jerry Jones keeps saying there's enough talent on this team to be a competitive team, to be a playoff team. It's up to you as the head coach to get it together, get it done, and get this team in the postseason. I think everybody knows Jason Garrett's under the gun for 2013. I think everybody knows that if this team doesn't make the postseason, uh, they're not. You know, Jason Garrett's probably not going to be in a in that position in 2014. So to hear him say, I think we're moving in the right direction. He better hope he's right because if he's reading the situation wrong, then this team's on their way to another eight and eight or uh, seven and nine season. He's probably going to be looking for an offensive coordinator position next year somewhere in the NFL. Yeah, unfortunately, he may be right in that he's headed the team in the right direction, but the same guy's picking the players for him, and that's his biggest liability right now. Yeah, they they they've had good drafts. They've had solid drafts the last few years, but certainly those three years after Bill Parcells left, they didn't do anything really to help him in terms of, you know, bridging the gap between the guys that Parcells drafted, like Demarcus Ware and Jay Ratliff and Jason Witten, and the guys that are beginning to make a difference that have actually been drafted uh, since uh, Jason Garrett was the head coach, or, or Jason Garrett had a huge say in why they were drafted. For instance, Des Bryant, Sean Lee, and uh, uh, Bruce Carter. So that, that gap between the end of the Parcells era and the last couple of years when they've actually hit on some guys that have made a difference, that's, that's where the talent gap is, you know, those three- to five-year veterans. That's why they don't, they don't have any of those guys on their roster anymore because none of those guys panned out because they didn't make good decisions on drafting those guys. And that's where the talent gap lies, and that's why the Cowboys are having to address things like the offensive line and the defensive line in this draft because they haven't grown those guys uh, that they should have grown from 2007 to 2009. Matthew, what's coming up on Rattle and Hump Sports? 
Well, we'll continue with our Cowboys coverage. Obviously, we'll keep you up to date on who's uh, spinning the turnstiles at Valley Ranch. I wouldn't expect to hear any major signings aside from uh, it sounds like the Romo extension could happen any day now. Uh, we'll have a lot of coverage on that. If Spencer signs an extension, we'll have a lot of coverage on that as well. Uh, understand that even if Romo does agree to an extension, say, in the next 24 hours, that doesn't necessarily mean that a uh, free agent signing is imminent because, as you mentioned before, having to sign their draft picks, the Cowboys need cap space to do that. It's not like there's a separate till of money to sign rookies. They still need cap space to do that, and they need several million in cap space to do that. So, theoretically, Romo's contract extension would be to open up cap space to sign the rookies. Uh, a Spencer re restructure would be really more to sign two or three veteran guys and the Cowboys have kind of alluded to the fact that they're really not interested in signing anybody until after the draft. Now, that may just be a smokescreen, but you know, aside from those two contract restructures, I wouldn't expect a whole lot out of this team over the next week or two unless somebody just happens to fall into their lap that is just the perfect situation, perfect guy, perfect system, got to have them. Let's find a way to get them. <laughs> and anything's possible at Valley Ranch. We know that. Anything is possible. Uh, hey, Matthew, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to reading more of your stuff on Rattle and Hum Sports. Matthew Poston's on Rattle and Hum Sports. I'm Brian Houston. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.